Today's big talking point, the Champions League. Alright my friends, how you all doing? Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to some Know The Score action. I know it's been some time ladies and gents, but it has been a hell of a week in the world of football this week. So I felt the need to come to the channel and have a little discussion about some of the stuff that's been going on my friends. Um, above I will link the playlist of this series if you are new to it. Do go check it out. Obviously a lot of that stuff is old news though. Uh, there's some stuff I want to talk about. The big thing is the Champions League. That was drawn yesterday. Some of the groups uh, look amazing, and I really think we're you know in for an excellent tournament once again. UEFA Player of the Year was announced, England squad was announced for the upcoming internationals, and obviously we had the devastating story that broke this week about Berry and Bolton, and we're going to get into all of these topics of conversation, my friends. But first up, Champions League group stages. So yes, ladies and gents, the Champions League for the 2019-2020 season was drawn yesterday. Uh, today, this uh, episode is going to be rained back ever so slightly. It's not going to have all the usual graphics, but I am about to put one up on the screen now so you can see all of the groups in all of their glory, ladies and gents. Uh, obviously, Liverpool looking to defend their Champions League crown that they won, uh, deservedly so, last season were excellent uh, throughout uh, the tournament, in my opinion. It was a great final between the two clubs. Uh, um, but we go again and all of these big, big clubs in Europe are going to be trying to get their hands on the richest prize in football. Um, group A, Paris Saint-Germain, Real Madrid, Club Brews, Galatasaray. Really, you're looking at that group. Two of the big boys that really stand out are PSG and Real Madrid. I'm sure we would all expect those two to come through the group. But at the end of the day, it's a Champions League. Anything can happen. Club Brugge obviously lost their striker to Aston Villa in the summer. That's a big loss for them. Galatasaray still putting the pieces in place, trying to rebuild at this moment in time. Then we come to Group B. You've got Bayern Munich uh, and one of the first of the English clubs in Tottenham, uh, Olympiakos and um, I don't even know how to pronounce the name of this team. So I'm not even going to try and attempt it. But yes, uh, those at the end. The minnows of the tournament, uh, my friends, this season. So relatively... Um, I actually think that's a relatively promising group for Tottenham. Bayern Munich are in the midst of a rebuild. A lot of their old guard have uh, hung up their boots, moved on. Um... So Tottenham really do stand a good chance in that group. I think, uh, you know, they could potentially top it as well if everything goes right for them. Uh, group C, we come to the second of the English club, Manchester City, Shakhtar Donetsk, uh, Dynamo Zagreb and Atalanta. I would really expect Manchester City to finish top of that group. Um, you know, that's I think that group is very, very kind and probably the easiest of the groups uh, for the English clubs for sure. Group D, Juventus, Atletico Madrid, Bayer Leverkusen and... Uh, and uh, Moskva, uh, that's going to be an interesting group, that one. Uh, Bayern, on, Bayern Leverkusen on their day, a very, very good team. We all know about Atletico Madrid going for a bit of a rebuild themselves. And Juventus, this is the competition that just keeps eluding them every single season. So that'll be a really interesting group uh, to keep our eyes on. Then we come to Group E, defending champions Liverpool in with Napoli once again. Uh, Salzburg and Genk, I think Napoli, Liverpool, we would expect those to come out of that group. Group F is the group of death, ladies and gents, for me this season. Barcelona, Borussia Dortmund, uh, Inter Milan and Slavia Praha. I don't know if anybody see the actual draw itself, but when Slavia Praha were drawn in the group, the uh, owners of the club and manager could do nothing but sit there and giggle. And you can understand why. Then we come to Group G, uh, Zenit, Benfica, Leon, uh, Leipzig. Really, that is anyone's for the take in that group. And I think all four of those teams are in a very good position to potentially finish top. I actually think that could be a really competitive group. And then we come to Group H and Chelsea are in with Ajax, who had a sensational Champions League run last year, Valencia and Lille. And I actually think that is a very difficult group for Frank Lampard to try and come out of. But yes, ladies and gents, that is the uh, group stages of the Champions League. Very, very interesting stuff. I love the Champions League. I'm a West Ham fan, so I never really, I'm never probably going to get to watch my team in this competition. Maybe I should have a bit more faith. Uh, I, I am only young. There's still plenty of time left, I guess. Uh, but the first uh, lot of fixtures do kick off uh, on the 17th and 18th of September. So if you're a fan of any of these teams, do tune in and do keep your eyes peeled. 
So next up, ladies and gents, we come to UEFA Player of the Year, and that was awarded last night as well. And um, Virgil van Dijk won the uh, UEFA's Player of the Year this time around, uh, beating Messi to second and Ronaldo to third. And I'm sure a lot of fans in the world of football would agree that this is a thoroughly well-deserved, uh, you know, award uh, for Virgil van Dijk. Really was the linchpin of Liverpool's defence last season. Was a massive part in their success. Success. You know, they did make a couple of very good additions. Obviously, Virgil van Dijk was added, you know, last January. Then they added Alisson uh, in the summer. And I think those two were excellent for Liverpool, made all the difference last season. Now, I'm not knocking van Dijk because I think, yes, I think he does deserve, uh, you know, to win an accolade like this after a really, really top season. But... Would other people, and do let me know in the comment section below if you agree with me, would some people maybe agree that the front three deserve to be higher up and potentially with a chance of winning that um, more so than Van Dijk? At the end of the day, it's all well and good to keep clean sheets and, you know, stop leaking goals. But without the goals, you don't win prizes. And Salah, Firmino and Mane did that for them. They all scored the goals at the other end. The important stuff for me. Mane has been one of Liverpool's best players consistently over the last, I'd say, two and a half, three seasons. I think he's an excellent player and maybe deserved to be a little bit higher up. That's not me knocking Van Dijk. I just think there are other players with pedigree that maybe should have been in with a chance of winning it uh, a bit more so than him, maybe. But that's just personal opinion. Other winners on the night, I will go through them as well. Women's Player of the Year went to Lucy Bronze, well deserved. Served. I'm not a huge fan of the women's game, but uh, did a little bit of reading. She had an excellent season by the sounds of things last year. Uh, Allison won Goalkeeper of the Year. I think that's well-deserved. More clean sheets than anyone else last season. Van Dijk won Defender of the Year, so a double bubble for him on the night. Frankie de Jong won uh, Midfielder of the Year, was excellent for Ajax, was arguably one of their best players. Uh, and Messi won Forward of the Year, not surprising really, 54 goals in 58 games. Sensational stuff, once again from Lionel Messi last season. We now come to the England squad announcement, ladies and gents. Uh, you may not know, but this weekend's uh, fixtures uh, across Europe are the last before a short international break. Um, it annoys me that it comes so soon into the new season starting, but it is what it is. Uh, with that being said, my friends, that does mean that match week four of the Premier League is the last one for about 10 days. I'll link above right now. That is my predictions for match week four. If you're yet to tune in and watch the Premier League show, maybe go give that a watch. Uh, it's well worth it. I promise you. Uh, but yeah, let's move on to this England squad announcement because for some people, there were some surprise inclusions and omissions. Uh, this squad has been drawn for the two games that are being played for the Euro 2020 qualifiers that are set to take place on the 7th of September and 10th of uh, September against Bulgaria and Kosovo, respectively, ladies and gents. Now, I have got to try and find the England squad. I am being completely unprepared here. Um, but yeah, uh, for me, some surprise inclusions uh, and some I really don't agree with as well uh there's some i do i think there's some i think really deserve the chance um but yeah i'm really not sure if i completely agree with a few of the players and it comes back to that whole thing of top six bias once again uh, i think the big clubs if you play for them you stand more of a chance even if you're not playing because you know constantly and consistently uh for the team uh so the england squad is as follows ladies and gents i do apologize for reading this off the phone uh but i didn't want to have to you know write it all down in my notes so the goalkeeper is going to be Tom Heaton, Jordan Pickford and Nick Pope. I don't have any problem with any of the goalkeepers. I think goalkeeper, the goalkeeper position, as far as England's concerned, is quite a weak position at the moment anyway. Uh, then the defenders, we come to our Trent Alexander-Arnold, Ben Chilwell, Joe Gomez, Michael Keane, Harry Maguire, uh, Tyro Mings, Danny Rose, Kieran Trippier and Aaron Wan-Bissaka. Uh, midfielders, we've got Ross Barkley, Jordan Henderson, James Madison, Mason Mount, uh, Oxley Chamberlain, Declan Rice and Harry Winks. And then the forwards, we've got Harry Kane, Jesse Lingard, uh, Marcus Rashford, Jaden Sancho, uh, Raheem Sterling and Callum Wilson. Now, I have a bit of an issue with that England squad. <coughs> Excuse me. And some people are not going to like this. 
But I think that the England team should be picked on nothing but form. I think if you're consistently playing well for your club, and especially from a striker standpoint, you're scoring goals on a consistent basis, then you should be considered. And there's a few names in there I just do not agree with being part of this team. It's as simple as that. Uh, Jesse Lingard, for instance. Why on earth is he deserving of a call-up in front of other players? Uh, you know, you look at his form recently for Manchester United. It's not been too great. He's not starting football games either he's coming off the bench and they're expecting him to make an impact and then you look at his form over the last few seasons as well and it is a mass surprise that he's still managing to find his way into the England squad now here's a hilarious stat for you one that I was sent by one of my friends this week it did, did give me a chuckle but Adam Johnson do we all remember him yes the uh, the paedophile the one that went down uh, yeah in the last six seasons he has more assists than Jesse Lingard does and he's been in prison for three of them so how effective and how impactful is Lingard? It's a big question, but he still finds himself into the football team. And now I know a lot of you say, well, then who do you call up if you don't call him up? Yes, there are questions. Is there enough strength in depth? Is there enough quality across the English football? But we shouldn't just be picking people for the sake of picking people and who they play for. The other one was Callum Wilson up front. What has he done to justify a place in the England squad? I'm not being funny, but Tammy Abrahams and Ashley Barnes both have more goals than him. And as far as an Englishman... Uh, uh, perspective is concerned, only Raheem Sterling has scored more goals this season than Ashley Barnes. So why is Ashley Barnes not worthy of a call up to the England squad? Is it because he plays for Burnley? Is it because he's 29 years of age? For me, we shouldn't be taking those things, you know, as factors where this is concerned. If he's consistently playing well and scoring goals and doing the job for his club, he should be good enough to play on the international stage. And for me, it is as simple as that. I think some of the other players that have been called up are well-deserved. I think Mason Mount, uh, James Madison, definitely. I think both of those have been excellent. Nice to see Declan Rice in there. Harry Winks has been coming back from, you know, an injury, so it's nice to see him in there. But there are a few. I think I was very surprised with Carl Walker not being included. You know, um, no, he's not been at his best uh, for Man City, but he's still one of the more consistent fullbacks in the league. Like Wan-Bissaka, for instance, is a really confusing one. How did he not get in last season when he was playing for Palace? Yet he plays a few games for United and they've not exactly been consistently great either, have they? He's probably playing worse now than he was last season and now he gets in. And it comes back to that. You know, if you play for a team that's big and it's got a huge reputation, you're more likely to get into the team. And I think that's all wrong and it should be picked on consistency. Uh, I am not the biggest international fan, but let's look forward to this football and the international break, ladies and gents, and hope that England can pick up six points and get their Euro campaign started off with a bang. And we're going to finish and know the score this week, ladies and gents, with the heartbreaking news about Berry and Bolton this week. Now, if you've been living under a rock and you haven't seen what's been going on, uh, both Berry and Bolton needed to find uh, new buyers and owners to rescue them uh, from basically, uh, you, you know, going out of existence uh, and being expelled from the EFL. Now, sadly, this week, that did happen to Berry. Bolton were saved at the final hour. So, you know, that's nice to hear for the Bolton fans. But um, Berry, unfortunately, a club that's 134 years old, a pillar of its community, has uh, been expelled from the EFL because it could not find an owner to save the football club. Now, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered where this is concerned. And, there, uh, you know, I think the EFL needs to review the way it does stuff as well. Not only is the ex-owner of Berry to blame, but I think the EFL has to take some of the blame as well. Um, you know, I can't imagine what the Berry fans are going through. And a lot of people are, you know, maybe saying, oh, but it's only Berry, they're only a small club. But anybody that follows a football club, you know that it is an extension of yourself. You become part of something bigger than you are. You become part of a community. Football is a family at the end of the day. And it doesn't matter if you've got a thousand fans or a hundred thousand fans. Uh, every club for me is the same because every fan is just as passionate about the club that they follow. And it was heartbreaking to hear the Berry fans talking the way they were and the fact that they have now lost their football club you know one lad was saying what am I going to do on a Saturday and a Sunday without Berry? how am I going to keep up with the you know with, with my mates and it was more to him than just football and that's what a lot of these people that own football clubs nowadays don't understand now talking of the ex-owner we do need to out the prick because uh 
the, the, the quotes that were coming out of you know his mouth, the shite that he was spouting on Five Live was quite disgusting. And I've got one here that I want to read out for you guys. And um, he was on there. Steve Dow is the owner. So if you want to try and find him on social media and give him some shit, do it. But yeah, he came out with, I never went to Bury, So for me to walk away from Bury and never go back is a very easy thing to do. I didn't even know there was a team called Bury. I'm not a football fan. Now, when you read a quote like that from the owner or ex-owner, we should say, of a football club, you then have to ask the question, if he gives that less of a shit and he's that bad at business, why on earth was he allowed to by the football club in the first place. This is a man who has had a, a number of companies and about 95% of them have all gone bust. He's clearly very shit at business and yet he was still allowed to buy a football team and one that he clearly didn't give a shit about as well. And I think that's wrong. So not only does Steve Dow have to take the blame for running this football club the wrong way and running it into the ground and into a position it's got found itself in, but the EFL have to take some blame as well. How did the EFL not look in into his background, uh, did they not look into you know the sort of person he was, uh, and, and 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 then allow him to buy the football club, knowing the history that he's got in business? It's all wrong, and it all needs to be reviewed. The other sad bit that's come out as well is that there was a new seven million pound offer uh, to buy Berry and try and rescue the club, and yet the EFL have uh, turned around and refused to overturn the expulsion from the EFL, and I think that is disgusting. Yes, I know there was a deadline, but this is a club that is, you know, has got a rich history. It's 134 years old. It's been there, but part of that community. It's got a fan base. It's got people that love it and would do anything for it. And even after that deadline was gone, at the final hour, they can't find a way to let this new buyer come in and save it. It's quite disgusting from my point of view. Now, how do we stop this from happening in future? Because we can't continue to allow clubs to be run this way into the ground and, uh, you know, and, and, and cease to exist. Because like I've already said they're an extension of us football clubs they they have got a community of their own and a family of their own and we don't want to see that happen now I've been doing a little bit of reading and you know um about other leagues around Europe and the way they do things um I, I didn't do enough reading about it, but I know Germany, uh, you know, that is a league that is thriving at the moment and their finances uh, and the way they look after the football clubs are done in a certain way and they're all reviewed year on year. Uh, the Dupla League was the one that was really interesting to me when I was reading about that. Uh, the Dupla League, for those that don't know, is the second division in Holland. And now every single one of the clubs is audited at the end of every season to make sure that that club is being run correctly. Uh, the finances are all in order. People are being paid etc etc and if they don't apply then obviously then it goes to the next stage and regulators come in and they look into it in more detail but Maybe this is something that should be happening in the English game as well. Maybe especially at the lower levels where there's not as much money, uh, we should be reviewing and auditing those football clubs year on year to make sure everything is above board and that this doesn't happen again. Um, there were some other stuff. There was things that were being said that I didn't agree with. There was one lad on Twitter who was spouting some nonsense about, you know, Manchester City and Manchester United, they've got loads of money. They should go in and buy them and save them. Now, the only analogy I can really give you is, say I've got a mortgage and I miss a few payments but I know the geezer on the corner earns you know under a thousand pound more than me a year I'm not going to go up there and ask him to pay my mortgage for me am I that's the easiest way I can put it at the end of the day if the club's being run wrong and the owners can't afford you know to, to bail them out and can't run the club properly the club does have to suffer but before the club suffers the EFL are there to step in and stop this thing happening and in this instance they haven't done their job so there has to be major questions asked of the EFL. Um, I didn't really want to, you know, end on a shitty uh, subject like that, but it was very sad. It's been, you know, all over, you know, Sky Sports news all week. Can I just say as well how distasteful it was from Sky Sports uh, and the way they dealt with um, this that was going on with Berry? They had a countdown to the deadline. Um, and don't get me wrong, I know they've made millions off of their transfer, you know, version of the deadline day and all the rest of it, but a 
a death deadline is essentially what it was, is just so disgusting on Sky Sports' part. They even got the leech that is, uh, you know, Jimmy Walker to come in and do it with his fucking tie and his, and his, oh, knob, can't stand him. And it's wrong and it's so distasteful because at the end of the day, it's more than a football club, as I've said numerous times. And, you know, it just can't be dealt with like this. It, it's exactly what the English media is like. Even giving Steve Dow, you know, airtime was disgusting on my part because he didn't deserve it feel for you Berry fans I, I really hope something can happen uh, as for Bolton keeping everything crossed that you know the, the people that have come in and bought the football club can try and save you but yeah like I've already said didn't want to finish on a on a sore note but had to talk about it because it's been all over the news this week do let me know in the comment section below what you make of that subject and all the other stuff that we've spoken about today. I know this was a bit more of a stripped back version of Know the Score, but there was some stuff I wanted to talk about, so come to the channel and I have done it. If you're new to the channel, my friends, please feel free uh, to hit that subscribe button. It's the best way to support me and the channel. Drop a like on the video. That's massively important, my friends, and it really is appreciated by your boy. But I am done and dusted. Uh, I will see you very soon for another Know the Score. I promise to try and bring these back a bit more often. Uh, the transfer window for the rest of uh, football closes next week. So maybe if some big deals get done, I'll come in on the channel and report them. But my friends, I am done. I am off. Uh, you've all been legends and I'll see you all later. Oh, yeah.